Well, last week we talked about gratitude, and I was uh, reminded by uh, a member of our, congregation, of our congregation who just happens to have taken Latin in school. I confess, I did not. And uh, he reminded me that the Latin root of the word gratitude actually means free. So there we go, that ties in with our theme. And I quoted Diana Butler Bass's words that at the center of Christian experience is this idea of the gift, the free gift of abundance. We are familiar with Jesus' words about abundant life that we hear in John's Gospel, chapter 10. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And in our faith tradition, this gift of abundance is received with humility and calls people to respond with gratitude and faithfulness. But the underlying idea is that this gift is freely given, this gratitude. In the Gospel of Matthew, it describes Jesus sharing the Passover feast with the disciples and adding new words to it that we now identify in our Eucharist or our communion service. We often repeat Jesus' words, take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Now, actually, the word take seems an odd word for a gift that is supposed to be freely given. And in fact, the word again in Greek, to take, labet, also means to receive. So you could use either of those. To take is to also mean to receive. And so in fact, Jesus is saying, receive these life-giving gifts. They are free, no strings attached, grace-filled. I read an article in Huffington Post by Henry Winton, and he writes, you know, about this, on this theme of hospitality, and he's actually writing it in the context of the U.S. political situation, describing how inhospitable it is, and the fact that folk cannot actually seem to gather around a table and be civil toward one another and find a good resolution to all sorts of concerns in that country at the time being. And he writes, everyone knows about Easter morning when a group of women discover the empty tomb. And many people also know the story of Easter afternoon, the walk to Emmaus, in which two disciples encounter a mysterious stranger who reveals himself to be the risen Christ, angels in our midst. But how about Easter evening? Who knows what happens then? Luke's story of Jesus appearing to his disciples in Jerusalem is less well known, but it is equally important for it revolves around a table instead of a tomb. A meal is familiar territory for Jesus. He is famous, as you know, for feeding crowds of 5,000 in Luke and 4,000 in the Gospel of Mark, and notorious for eating with tax collectors and sinners. His hospitality reveals his desire to nourish people, both physically and spiritually. At a table, he eats with Pharisees and forgives a sinful woman and he institutes the Lord's Supper at the Passover. He later hits the beach to cook a fish breakfast for his disciples, as we read in the Gospel of John, and Jesus offers a welcoming table and instructs his followers in the nature of hospitality with the words, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, as we find in the story of Luke chapter 14. So this whole idea of the nature of hospitality, of what it means to gather at table. Now, when I was a, a youth, actually, ironically, uh, the name of our youth group was Emmaus, so that was hearkening back to that story of Jesus gathering in their midst and sharing a meal with them. But back in those days, it, we were a little more traditional in one sense. Uh, the minister that I had at the time was very high liturgy. I think he was a closet Anglican. I'm just saying, yes, uh, we did have a, a cross and we had a processional we, and I took my turn to be the crucifer and process, lead the choir into our worship behind the cross. 
but uh, our youth group's name was Emmaus, and it was harkening back to that memory of gathering and Jesus appearing to the disciples at a mealtime. So, as I said, we were kind of a little bit traditional in the other sense that we were not, until we were confirmed, we were not to take communion. That was a no-no. You didn't do that until you'd gone through the whole, and boy, I had to write an exam. I mean, it was not a one-day thing. We had to go Saturday mornings for weeks, and we had to write an exam and study and learn stuff before we could get that little piece of bread and juice. So, as a teenager, though, we would gather once a month and have what he termed an agape meal, and the meal named after agape or love. And it was modeled after the Eucharist or communion, but it involved everyone bringing something to share, kind of like a potluck. And all of us youth would gather around an extended table. We just make a big, huge table. And sometimes there were 20 or 30 of us. And then after we'd shared that meal, then we would go into the sanctuary and we would ha have that kind of extended agape meal. And we would basically have a communion service. So that was kind of my introduction to that understanding of Eucharist or communion. It was a gathering out of love. It was a gathering of community. It was a gathering together and sharing what you had and spending that time together in God's presence. Now, our theme today was about hospitality at table, and I have to think about our Friday night food trucks. Uh, for the Fridays that I've been there, to sit down at a picnic table and uh, sit neck elbow to elbow, perhaps with a neighbor that lives right around the corner from us that I would not otherwise have ever met. The opportunity to meet folk that are normally here on a Sunday morning or complete strangers. Families come, grandparents with their grandchildren, they bring the portable high chairs and the strollers, and it's just lovely. Some will bring blankets and sit and gather together. I know there's a great front row section of Trinity folk who like to have the good view of the food trucks and what the good meals are for that week. They kind of, I think they do a little running tab. How many have ordered from that truck, and is that the one that we should get our meal from this week? It's lovely gathering at table of community, and we never know who we might meet in those moments. It could be Christ himself. There's no doubt that there is something transformative about gathering together around a table for a meal. Now, sometimes the gathering can be difficult or awkward, I appreciate that, depending on family dynamics and history. But at its best, sharing food and drink around a table is one of the best ways to connect with one another. In our fast-paced world, a family sitting down together for a meal is becoming more and more unique. And increasingly, when we do gather around a table, you've seen this at a restaurant, I know, half of those gathered might have their noses in an iPad or a cell phone checking their latest social media feed. Or, heaven forbid, they might actually be texting one another across the table. At its best, gathering around a table together is a time of connection, of blessing received and given of time set apart to share joys and sorrows, to be family or kindred, a sense of belonging to one another. Perhaps a time of nurturing and sustaining as we refuel and prepare ourselves to leave the table and head back into the world and all it may demand of us. It can be a grace-filled, transformative time when we remember who we are as beloved children connected, belonging to an extended family of neighbor and friend, ready to step out into the world once more, replenished and energized, perhaps even transformed. I don't know if any of you follow that television series, Blue B Bloods, can't say that, Blue Bloods. Anybody seen it? New York cop, head of the et cetera, et cetera, family all involved, whether through district attorney or street cops, the commissioner of New York. On every episode, they end with the multi-generations of the family gathering around the table. And whatever theme or subject has been discussed or presented that week, they kind of do this dialogue sharing back and forth, in a sense, what they've learned from the experience. And being the fact that it's multi-generational, it's lovely to see how the different opinions and perspectives are uh, examined. 
But also a key component of that gathering is always that they start with grace because they are a good Irish Catholic family. So there are layers of this fellowship at this table that is about connecting as familial, but also a sense of connecting with the world beyond their table and where their faith intersects with not only their personal relationships, but the relationships that they each have out in the world and in their workplace. So it's a very intriguing uh, concept. You don't often see it on television these days, but I, I think of that when I'm thinking of hospitality at table and the importance of gathering around table as community of faith. Seamus Heaney, when asked to talk about his spirit, spirituality, wrote the following poem reflecting on his Catholic experience of Eucharist growing up. He writes, like everybody else, I bowed my head during the consecration of the bread and wine, lifted my eyes to the raised host and raised chalice, believed whatever it means that a change occurred. I went to the altar rails and received the mystery on my tongue, returned to my place, shut my eyes fast, made an act of thanksgiving, opened my eyes, and felt time starting up again. I think what he's reflecting on here is a bit of that mystery sometimes of what happens around a gathered table, those angels in our midst, those blessings that come into our lives when we least expect it, the presence of Christ at table. For Diana Butler Bass, Eucharist remains always holding out the mystery of gift in that experience, life and joy for all, receiving and giving thanks, and as a result, the world made new. It is in the breaking of bread around a table when we recognize Christ as the divine mystery. We recognize a sense of our world changing, even a fraction. We recognize that we are not necessarily the center of our universe, but in fact, we are one of many who gather at this table of life. And we receive this gift of life and joy freely in love. That is what this table is about. I'd like to now flow into what we term our great thanksgiving, the prayers related to our communion table. And I'm going to lead us into those and into communion now as a part of our experience. We've heard the words spoken about hospitality at table, and now we are going to experience that hospitality at table as we share in this bread and this juice.